Hello, this is Brian Funk, and thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. I'm very excited to announce that my new book, The Five Minute Music Producer, is now available in paperback form, a real book that you can hold and touch and turn to any page you like in a second. And it's a pretty big book, 629 pages of activities, exercises, and wisdom I've learned over the years. It's available on Amazon.com. Five Minute Music Producer is 365 music making activities that will help with your songwriting and music production. It'll help you fight writer's block, make more music, write better lyrics, develop solid workflows, learn techniques for generating ideas, and finish more music. It's like having your very own music production personal trainer giving you ideas and challenges each day. And the best part is the challenges are quick and easy and they only take a few minutes. So even if you don't have a lot of time, you can spend five minutes and advance your music production skills. There's no better time to improve your music than now. Imagine where you'll be after a year of these activities. The five minute music producer has hit the number one new release in the music songwriting and music recording and sound categories on Amazon. So check out the five minute music producer, 365 music making activities. It's available on amazon.com or you can go to brianfunk.com slash book. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I'm very happy to be reunited with Jorgen Chelgren. Jorgen is a musician from Sweden. Uh, he's been on the show a couple times. He was on episode 129 when he was talking about some ambient albums he was putting out. Um, he did nine in a year. That was pretty amazing. And he was also back on episode 171, where he did a guided meditation, which was a really nice kind of collaboration and a little departure for this podcast, but I think it came out really cool. Um, since then, he's produced some new music. He's got an album called Bluebird coming out in September, and I had to listen to it, and I love it. And it's a little different from the ambient stuff that we talked about last time, more singer-songwriter folk stuff, but there's definitely some ambient influence peeking its head in there, too. Um, so welcome back, Jorgen. Great to see you. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. It's been I a wanna, while. <laughs> yeah, it's, I guess uh, we did this uh, guided meditation. I feel like we might have been in lockdown at that point. Yeah, I think that's why we did it. Actually. I think we were trying to spread some peace and calm, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So call, maybe... <laughs> yeah. What is that, three years ago or something like That's that? three years. Yeah. Yeah. So weird. Time has just gotten very odd since then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely that's like a point, though, in the timeline of, I guess, everyone's life. Yeah, exactly. Like a pre or post thing and whatever. Whatever happened yeah. in between. So it's like a mush. <laughs> I want to paint you a little picture of what I was doing yesterday because... <clears throat> It was a beautiful day here in New York on Long Island, and I decided to go to the beach, North Shore Beach, Rocky Beach, and just hang out. And I had your album, you know, in pre preparation for this episode. So I put it on, and I have this little method of relaxation I like to do in the water. The, the Long Island sound is very calm, so it's not like an ocean with big waves, so it's really relaxing. And I've got a pair of Crocs, <laughs> oh, yeah. which you kind of need like water shoes around there just because of the rocks. But I like them because they float. Right. So I put, put them on my feet and then I've got like two pool noodles under mm -hmm. my arms <laughs> and I'm laying back and I got your album playing and I'm just floating around in the Long Island Sound. And it was the perfect soundtrack. It was just great. It felt really nice, really peaceful. Um, it was, it's a really nice collection of songs and then some kind of interlude pieces that kind of just set the vibe of the album. And if uh, anyone, I like to talk about this a lot, like what is your listener doing when, the, when you put on their music? And that's what I was doing and it was a perfect match. So oh, thank yeah. you for a great afternoon. <laughs> oh, that sounds awesome. And uh, that makes me, makes me happy that you had that moment. Yeah, I think even this, even though this is like a, I guess it's a, like a folk or psychedelic folk album. It's just somewhere in my nature, I guess, that it's like this ambient thing that just keeps on coming through. 
I try to I try to avoid it a little bit. It's not good. You know, <laughs> I couldn't couldn't help myself. Well, it's got um a feeling, you know, and and I like that in an album that it has like a consistent thing that goes throughout. It feels like one unified thing. And um, a lot of the sort of ambient sounds within even the the more traditional songs uh, connect through into some of the more interlude type songs, the instrumental things that connect everything together. So it's great for, you know, it accomplishes the same sort of thing an ambient record does with setting a mood, setting a vibe, creating a feeling. That's, that's great. That's great to hear. I think it's, uh, so when I did, let's see, when we first or talked the last time, I had done all of the ambient stuff. And then at the start of lockdown, I did an EP called uh, Hollywood, where I, so a bunch of years ago, I decided to, that for every new project, I had to add something or take something out. Basically, just do something that I haven't done before. So for the Hollywood album, which came out in 2020, I think, I started playing acoustic guitar, which, uh, well, I mean, that's sort of where I come from. So I knew how to do that, but I haven't done that. I hadn't done it in a while. That affected the structure of the tunes, even if Hollywood is a, an instrumental album for the most part. And then so when I wanted to start the thing that the sort of the project that came, the Bluebird album. I was thinking about okay, so what do I do now that I haven't done it uh, before? I haven't done it in a while. Uh, the sort of next logical step was lyrics and singing, uh, which I have done in the past, but in Swedish. So mm. yeah, I started writing lyrics in English, and that also, of course, made the song structures more folky or traditional in that sense. Mm. Uh, but there's, I guess the sound palette uh, is fairly closely connected to the ambient stuff I've, I've been doing before, I think. Mm. Well, on the ambient stuff, I know you relied heavily on the OP1. Yeah. I'm, I'm, am I mistaken? Do I hear it kind of peeking its head in there a little bit? It's on this? in there. Uh, actually, I've sold it, which was a mistake. But when I started the project, I had it. And it's it's in there in some, uh, you know, like tape loop stuff and some, some of the synth uh, sample bits that, that, I, that I put on the album. I'm not sure why I sold it. I shouldn't have. I think I just... Sometimes I sort of fall out of love with, uh, with, with instruments, and I don't want to be nostalgic about gear. But the downside mm. of that is that sometimes I sell stuff too soon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, maybe I'll have to get another one or something. <laughs> That's something I think that happens. You, we either get rid of stuff too soon or hold on to it too long. Yeah, exactly. It's um, really hard to find a good balance there. I'm surprised to hear you sold your OP1, though. Um, yeah. It, it seems like such a part of your workflow. From yeah, exactly. Class. Maybe maybe that's why I sort of felt like I should get rid of it or something. I don't know. Yeah. Just to start fresh. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fun thing to do when you move on to new projects is to think of, okay, I, you know, I'm going to have this new angle. Yeah. Whether it's like this time I'm going to have lyrics, I'm going to write them in English. Yeah. And that right away just kind of eliminates a lot of options for one it sets you on a path i think it's i think it's important if you want to actually get stuff done and have some direction yeah yeah i think so uh, we probably talked about that also the last time but i try to set up restrictions at the start of a project and sort of structure them in a way that sort of prop propels me forward so uh, I sort of make up these fairly strict rules around what I'm trying to create, and then I sort of break them on as, as you know, I progress. But I start with something that's fairly, usually fairly minimal. Yeah. And what were your parameters, or did you have any rules for this particular release, Bluebird? Yeah, well, so I started. Uh, I started doing these. 
I had, I had this idea like, what, with like, okay, so I want to make like proper songs with lyrics, singing, and based around like acoustic guitar. So kind of folky in a way, and structural. And then, and so I, I did, uh, I started doing like morning sessions with uh, just a note, notepad and like scribbling mm-hmm. lyrics and, you know, like they used to write songs in the old days. Mm. Uh, and, and then I had a bunch of tunes that I liked and uh, after that it was probably uh, just like starting I, I had them like on my phone and just voice memory sketches and uh, then it was time to sort of record them properly I had a few sounds that I wanted to use I wanted to get the uh, a particular drum machine in there and, and I had found this sample instrument there's this thing, I think it's called the Orchestron, it's like a, a, a relative to the to Mellotron it's like, a, hmm. maybe it's vinyl based it's instead of tape based oh wow one of those early like sampler type of yeah things. exactly, and I got the sample pack from What's his face? Uh, oh, I can't remember. The, he ha- he has the hanging out with audio files podcast. Oh, uh, Jamie Liddell. Exactly. Yeah, Jamie Liddell. Hmm. I really love that sound, and I so I wanted to use like that drum machine, and then uh, my Gretsch guitar you can see in the background, and and sort of just went from there basically. And right. then I I mean running stuff through guitar pedals and all that stuff to make, mm. make things sound worse. <laughs> <laughs> the, the sounds are great on the record. Um, there's, oh, cool. I mean, at, at points, um, you almost start to blend the guitars with the synth sounds in a way that, I guess, through the pedals, like you said, and maybe mm. just how you're programming the synth, sometimes you kind of lose track of what's what. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's a win for me. I think I wanted to get, I wanted to make this. Uh, I don't know how to describe it, really, but sort of a cinematic or dreamy uh, sound, like world of sounds or universe or something. I think I, I think I was successful. <laughs> yeah, Hopefully I'd say I so. Yeah. yeah, if you're floating in the Long Island Sound, anyway, it feels that yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the the lyric part is interesting because um, I'm I'm not that kind of a songwriter. I don't have like stuff to say. I don't have topics that I'm. I don't, there's not like uh, at least not on a conscious level. So I had read this book uh, by uh, Jeff Tweedy. It's called How to Write One Song. Love I it. really loved it, and it, and it has yeah. some methods in it. Uh, to sort of yes get started writing and finishing lyrics and songs so I used a few of the methods in there I think one one that I liked the most was I picked uh, I picked like words from like one page of a book or something like that and just like a word or a sentence or half a sentence that I liked and I wrote something around that and sort of filled in the gaps. And, mm. and uh, when I had something that looked like, say, two verses and a chorus, I started rearranging lines, almost like sort of cut out poetry, to get something that I enjoyed singing that sort of sounded like a song, but I wasn't sure what it was about. Uh, mm. So in, in a way, I wanted to... Because I, I didn't have anything like, you know, oh, this album is going to be about this and that and the other thing. This song is going to tell this and the other story. I didn't have anything like that. So I just sort of tried to play around with word, with the lyrics, sentences and stuff, just to and see if there was like stuff. <laughs> this is, it's getting a bit pretentious now, so buckle up. But if there's like, uh, there was a story I was trying to say that I didn't know 
like what what stories am I telling when I'm not sort of when I'm sort of looking the other way? Uh, mm. So there, uh, in, I don't really know what the album's about. <laughs> I mean, I have a few clues, but uh, and I kind of like that because it keeps it interesting to me. And hopefully, if I come back to this song in you know a couple of years or so, they'll have a new meaning for me, or I'll see something in them that I haven't seen before. Hmm. That's a cool way to write um, because I think a lot of people feel like I need to have a big message. I need to have yeah. something that I'm, I, or uh, then that can often lead people to thinking like I need to have had something bad happen to me. I need to be yeah. suffering, and of course that can lead to great music, but it doesn't mean you have to be. Um, you can still find stuff. We're all interesting people with a lot going on and if you yeah, just yeah, yeah. explore you find the things to say yeah and even in the sort of most mundane stuff that yeah. we all go through there's there are sort of snippets of magic in there with the news. i yeah. think actually i think jeff tweeted does this really well but i imagine it's sort of unpredictable because I, there's so many songs of this that i absolutely love and I have no clue what they're about, but they still mm -hmm. sort of connect somehow. I don't know what it is that does it, and like how, I don't think he can control it either. Uh, so there's, there's something that happens uh, that is probably hard to sort of describe. It's more, maybe maybe it's just like mostly luck <laughs> or something. I think there's a lot of luck to it. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. And, and you you have to show up to get lucky, right? You gotta mm -hmm. be in it to win it kind of thing. So if yeah, you yeah. keep keep at it, um, sometimes cool things happen. Yeah, for sure. I like using those techniques. I love that book, by the mm -hmm. way. It's great. Um, but sometimes even just singing gibberish and yep. by getting free enough to sound stupid mm -hmm. <laughs> and not yeah. care yeah that's when a lot of interesting things happen and and it is like you said you, i like the way you put it telling the story the stories i tell when i'm looking the other way yeah because it's sort of gets at your subconscious i think on a level too yeah exactly that was sort of the goal i guess or intention uh, or something i was hoping for because it's really, I don't, I don't enjoy it so much when, well, let's say I've written a song and, and, and someone asks me what it's about. And if I know what it's about, then, and, 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 and I'm able to sort of communicate that, to say, that, well, this song is about that one time when I was, you know, whatever the song's about. It sort of takes away the magic. It's better if you don't know <laughs> what it's about, yeah. but there's still something in there that connects with Hmm. Yeah, sometimes that can spoil it for listeners too. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, I thought it was that, but I guess it's not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I think in this way too, meanings sort of emerge and they're <clears throat> more flexible. I've yeah, looked sure. at songs of mine where they were, I, I've kind of write like that a lot too, where I'm kind of using chance to yeah. produce the lines and then work around that. And sometimes I look at them and I, I learn stuff about myself. And then other times I, I realize like, that's not really how I feel. Yeah. It's maybe yeah, yeah. A, a fleeting, you know, flash in my mind. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes those are fun to follow too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think those are the like, it doesn't have to be, I mean, songs or lyrics and maybe songs in general, they're not like a, they don't have to be, it's not like a school recital, right? Where we sort of show what we've learned so far. It's, uh -huh. that would make it fairly boring for us as artists, I think. Uh, there's, there's something else there that was like, okay, this is the idea I had on the day I wrote this song. You know? Yeah, I kind of like it. It's, you know, I'll write something else tomorrow or, you know. Uh, so they're like, I guess, snippets or snapshots. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to put out something 
a little abstract and then yeah. kind of let the music also be part of that. And then, then the listener gets involved mm. in determining the meaning, yeah. figuring out what's going on. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's really cool that you still went forward, you know, with the writing of the lyrics and didn't feel like first I need this thing. Because I think that gets us stuck all the time. Even in music, first I need to know what kind of song. First I need some gear. First I need this. It's just, no, you, you actually don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And maybe, I mean, for me, um, my, my my day job is as a copywriter. So, so I don't have uh, trouble putting words to paper. So I can just... I could just scribble and did and, and be playful and oh, like just didn't really mean anything to me. Or I, it didn't. Uh, it was sort of risk free. Uh, mm. And then, sort of after a while, themes started to emerge and stuff like that. And I, I actually had enjoyed the as just for sort of the fact that it was sort of abstract as a workflow. I enjoy that because in my day job, uh, things are usually very, very sort of clearly formulated right. tasks. Very specific, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Goals and uh, problems to solve and all of that stuff. So mm. I really enjoyed getting away from that and just being like naive about it. Right. Make people read between the lines a little. Mm, exactly. <laughs> Instead of spelling it out for them all the time. Yeah. <laughs> That's a funny contrast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think I think this album took me. It's been sort of a long and I mean, it probably took two years from start to finish, and in between, we bought a house and moved and all of that stuff. So it was mm. uh, fairly long periods that I. Uh, where I didn't work on the music or where I actually felt like I had sort of abandoned the project and where there were like slumps where I didn't like any of it at all and it was a bit of all that stuff. So it's a bit of a journey in that sense. But something, I think that I had maybe, let's say six or seven songs and it was like, okay, we're close to an album now, but I don't think I have that much more in me for this project. <laughs> you know, and you know how you you work on the thing for long enough that you get start getting ideas for the next project. <laughs> yeah. And that sounds <laughs> then that then that that starts to look a lot more appealing than the thing you're working on. Uh, but so for this for the blue bluebird project, I started somewhere in the middle, I started sort of as a hobby to to um, to play I've always wanted to be able to play these like solo jazz tunes, like, you know, like Joe Pass and Jim Hall and all of those legends. Mm. So I started working on some of that stuff, more like, like a hobby. Uh, and, uh, and, and some of that, like I, ideas from that way of thinking became the, these interludes that I call the et et etudes. These like in instrumental guitar things that come in and out, and I felt like uh, they maybe they didn't tie the whole thing together, but but they sort of uh, created this sort of I don't know background of uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's more like a I think it it sort of gel they gelled the album together in the sense that you described when you were floating in the sound that it's like it's a even if it's nine tracks, I think, or ten songs or whatever, it's still a sort of a coherent listening experience. Uh, mm. That's how I felt when I sort of finished. Yeah, I think very much so. And to the fact that there were times where I didn't really know w how far into the album I was, what yeah, song yeah. I was on to, because they kind of... I don't know if they exactly blend into each other all the time, but they definitely like those etudes. Is that how you say etude? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not they sure. kind of they're like little bridges, they're little pathways. Yeah. And um, 
and they help really because they have a similarity too. Mm-hmm. It it gives this kind of like recurring theme that happens that we and yeah. It also gives you some breathing room between the songs. Yeah, so like kind of, a, they kind of soak in a little bit. Yeah, they. The idea was for them to work as sort of palate cleansers, <laughs> like hmm. the, uh, the like uh, what is it? The ginger you eat between sushi bites. <laughs> right. <laughs> Or something yeah, like I that. think they work well like that. They kind of keep you in the in the spot in that place for the album, yeah. and then I mean, sometimes when you have song after song after song, they it's a lot to take in yeah. every two and a half, three minutes. That okay, here we go again. Yeah, <laughs> and I've always liked album that has some of that stuff. Like you know, I don't know. Let's say track six or seven is just this thing that wasn't really intended to be a full song but it's like someone was jamming in the studio and something fades in and out yeah. uh, and it can be sort of a, a, a piece of music that isn't so in isn't so sort of fully focused or on being like here's a song here's, here's, here's a tune it starts and it ends it's just like a piece of music that floats in and out. Uh, hmm. I've always liked that stuff, which maybe is not uh, a surprise coming from an Indian producer, but still. <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. And I can hear that guitar work you were talking about, the jazzy stuff. I really enjoyed the guitar work on this album. Uh, lots of like nice combination of sounds from acoustic to electric and some really tasteful playing going on where just some stuff uh, really kind of um, not many notes at a lot of times, but a lot said with those notes. Yeah. Well. And just some great voicings and really on a guitar level is great lesson. Thank you. Thank you so much. That means a lot. I mean, I was going as fast as I could. <laughs> I'm not, I've never been a very technical player, but I, I yeah, I, I like the... the those sort of vibey, big-ish sounds. So yeah, mm. I'm glad that worked. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely helps give it a, a mood and a feel, breaks up the lyrics a bit. Yeah. Keeps things moving. And um, the vocals too, just wanna say while we're at it, you know, sound great. Really nice register you're singing in, really relaxed. Um, with great melodies without being so over the top, you know, sometimes m- melodies dance around a lot and you, you have a nice balance of keeping that relaxed enough feeling, but still it's not just a very like monotone delivery either. Yeah. Some nice melodies. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I guess my Catch singing is stuff. a bit sort of conversational in a way, but I, yeah. The thing with the with actually recording the lyrics, I had done all of them uh, on at home on my own, the, like all the lyric, uh, all the song, all the vocals, I should say. But I, when I had like sort of, I felt like okay, this is a finished album now. I sort of realized that well, the lyrics don't really, from a, I guess recording technique or sound quality standpoint, they didn't really cut it. So hmm. I redid all of them with uh, a friend of mine as a studio. Uh, so I went in there for, um, I don't know, a day, a day and a half or something and redid all the vocals. And it was just so um, liberating, I think is the right word to work with. A, he's a good like a vocal producer, but like just, just to have an engineer there. That starts and stops right. the, not the tape, but whatever you the door, I guess. And you don't have to think about any of that because that sort of, it really sort of takes me out of the zone when I record lyrics or record song, uh, vocals myself and I have to sort of press the mm. space bar and go back and do all of the, you know, thing yeah. in, in, in Ableton. So that was really good. And I, since I had, uh, I'd been singing the 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 
all the vocal tracks while I, I had already done done it once. I could just sort of redo it fairly quickly, but with a lot better sound and mm. the the monitoring and all of that stuff. So that was a lot of fun. I felt like a proper singer for a day, which uh, <laughs> doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> you sound like one. Well, I'll say that. Thank you. It sounds great. Um, you make a good point. I've when you're recording vocals, it's. I mean, for me, especially, it's the most vulnerable thing I'm doing. Yeah. You know, like any instrument I'll, I'll pick up and if I don't know how to play it, I'm not like embarrassed about it. <laughs> but sometimes when I record vocals, I'm just like, oh God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and when you're recording it yourself, you have to be so cognizant of if it's actually a good take. Yeah. And then you also have to be in that zone where you're not worrying about if it's a good take and you're just feeling it and you're mm. getting into the music and it's, they're just like at odds, those mindsets. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's really hard to sort of jump between them. So that was yeah. really, really good to, to use uh, an engineer for that. I think I'm going to do more of that. Uh, if again, whenever I make another album. I'm sure I'm, I'll make another album. I just don't know what it'll be yet, but mm. maybe spend a day recording acoustic guitar or whatever, <laughs> just to, to like, to be able to be just like fully a music musician. Someone else can be a engineer or produce a little yeah. bit for, for a while. Yeah. It's easy to forget that when we record our own songs, you know, laptop musicians or home music studios stuff, we're doing the jobs of what used to be many people. Yeah, exactly. Which you're, I mean, it's a good talent. skill to have. Uh, yeah. It can be really useful, but it was very, it felt very, very sort of luxurious to just stand in a, in a <laughs> booth and, you know, be right. an artist. <laughs> Yeah, just go for it. Yeah. Someone else is going to take care of it. Yeah, was, yeah that is nice. Really what was your recording process like? Um, were you, I'm, I'm guessing you kind of had the songs written first yes. before you're starting to record, right? Based uh, on what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. I did. Um, so for some of the songs I had like, uh, I guess, production ideas. Let's say I wa knew I wanted to try a drum machine or something like that. And then I, so then I recorded probably like scratch vocals and acoustic guitars to a click track and so then sort of build things up uh, from mm -hmm. there. And then some, uh, so that's, I guess, fairly straightforward uh, as a recording process. Mm -hmm. I did uh, because Looking back, especially on on uh, on on the uh, on the ambient music I've I've made earlier, it's fairly minimal in terms of you know how many tracks I use. I can like maybe if I'm making ambient music and I have like five channels of synth, that's like a fully fledged track, to, like a production to me. And I wanted for this album to make the effort of like adding more detail. Uh, things to come in and out and like uh, work with uh, stuff in the background, stuff in the foreground, left, right, you know, all weird things mm. that like someone else might take out, all of that, you know. So I guess um, putting more effort into the production, basically. Uh, and that was also a lot of fun, but because my sort of natural inclination is fairly minimal. Uh, and it's not like the Bluebird album is some sort of a overblown. Uh, uh, oh no, not at like all. A, a giant project or by any stretch, but it's probably the most ambitious I've worked on. I think in terms of how many channels I used and what I did to the sounds and all of that stuff. So that was a that was also fun, and to let to let it sort of take time. Uh, yeah, that was a, another thing I learned. Maybe I learned it from your podcast or from somewhere else where like, if I had a, a rough version of like I've started work on a track, I had like, uh, some basic recording to just put it on my phone and go for a walk and listen 
Uh, after mm. a while, you start feeling like, well, there's uh, something should happen here, or this part is too long, and that shouldn't like th- those lyrics doesn't work, or uh, the things that you can feel intuitively while you're away from your computer, like not looking in your door to see where there are, you know, clusters right. of tracks or whatever. Uh, so that was also something I did early on. And, like, and then I had like notes that said stuff like add a weird sound to the second verse or whatever. And then I could sort mm-hmm. of go back into the studio, you know, f- go find a pedal that I didn't really know what it does. And, uh, you know, you know, like just make up some weird stuff and see if it fits. That was really <laughs> fun. That's cool. Yeah. When you step away, you get this, kind of you can take the music in as a whole more yeah especially if you're sort of occupied yeah i often like to be kind of doing something else while i'm listening Mm -hmm. and this way because at the computer at in the studio you're you've got the microscope out the magnifying glass yeah exactly and you, you don't see the big picture sometimes you lose sight of that it's a weird thing that 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 when you're sort of looking looking in your computer, you don't really experience the music as music. I think you're, lo- you're looking at it mm-hmm. and, and you go, okay, two, two more bars and then the Hyatt comes in and then you just hear the Hyatt come in two bars later, but you don't mm-hmm. really think you about, s- yeah, exactly. It's just scrolls see by. It coming along yeah, the screen. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't really think about, should it be that at all? I just hear it coming in or dropping out or whatever. Yeah. But when you sort of, if you don't, if you're not looking at it, you can hear it, you know, Right. Quite different way, I think. Yeah, it's almost like your sounds are on a conveyor belt and they're just coming across <laughs> this playhead. Yeah, exactly. And I've had that feeling where like the music sounds like it's just coming along. It's just yeah. uh, like f- loading by. Yeah, I exactly. Guess. Yeah, and, it starts and it stops uh, after a while and then it's just, right, what was that? Yeah. It looked good on the screen. I guess it's a good song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I like that way of working though, that um, kind of putting down like the scratch guitar, get the idea of the song there yeah. and then build around it and then you replace as you need. Um, it, it keeps you focused on what's important because I've definitely had this experience where I if I don't do that, if I don't have like the vocal line there, the kind of focal element, all of a sudden I start building everything up at yeah. every stage of my process. is like, oh, I got the drums and the drums sound perfect mm-hmm. on their own. And then we add the next part in and now I got to adjust the drums a little bit because <laughs> yeah, exactly. they can't take up that much space. And when you have those uh, big picture elements, those focal points ready, then you can, and you mentioned it kind of, you thought about it like foreground, background, and yeah. left and right. You can place things much better. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not like a great uh, mixing engineer or anything like that, but I really had fun working on that stuff, trying to see where I could fit things in, where, where there was gaps or where there should mm-hmm. be a gap or, you know, all of that stuff. That was a lot of fun. Right. Well, it still has a nice minimal vibe too. Yeah, it's cool. It's not over the top. Um, and I, I think I have the opposite problem of you. My temptation is to try to just keep adding stuff because I can. I have all these tracks. Yeah. A lot of the best stuff I do is after I start deleting things away. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably very common. Yeah, um, I hear that more than I hear... I, I tend to do too little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People have like all these capabilities, so they want to use them all. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a, that's good to know about yourself though, too, that this is the way I tend. Mm. You know, these are the mistakes I tend to make or the um, preferences I tend to have. Yeah, I think that's my sort of natural uh, way of like, I, I add some stuff, uh, uh, Add a few basic tracks and the, something that's that adds maybe 
a bit of uh, interest. And then I just like, all right, cool. Well, that sounds about done. And it's like, I don't know, 11 tracks or whatever. But then I had to catch myself and go, well, yeah, but what if there was more? <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 uh, it's still like, if I add what I feel like uh, a lot more things to a, pro- to a production, it still probably maxes out at, I don't know, 22 tracks or whatever. So it's like, it's not like, mm. you know, huge stuff, but I, I had fun sort of disciplining myself to, to be a little bit less minimal uh, this time. Mm. Well, there's songs that you can get away with it. Yeah. Minimalism too. So yeah, yeah, that's always sure. nice when you're working with material that is going to stand up on its own. Mm. You know, even if it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Were you kind of like performing these songs for a little while, working them out before you actually put them down? I've played them live. No, actually, I had them all recorded before I played them live first. So if I were to go on tour now or play a few gigs, I think there are a few evolutions sort of uh to the songs because i was rehearsing them we did a i did a show sometime before the summer and i played them a lot at home because i was doing it was just me and then i had a sample sampler with a few bits and bobs on and and then the the songs started to change a bit uh, or some of the songs at least which i really enjoyed uh, so I feel like performing them live would be a lot of fun. And I think they would sort of grow sort of away from what the album sounds like, uh, mm. a little bit, I think, I think. Are you playing alone solo or do you have anyone playing with you? I or did. You? I did. Uh, that was solo shows. I started, um, I had the idea to have like just me singing and playing guitar and then using the push to, to trigger stuff. But it got, once I started sort of working on that, it got, got a bit fiddly with, with playing guitar and trying to be a good Mm. guitar player uh, and singer. So I moved a few of the like electronic elements that I felt like I had to have in the live set. I moved them over to a, a sampler and so I could just it was like just a lot less to hmm. uh, to mess up basically so I had a right. few backgrounds yeah. going uh, like loopy stuff some you know like the uh, things that are not sort of time sensitive so I didn't have to like make sure I could hit a beat or things like that so, right um, so you're not you don't need to be playing along to like a metronome or anything exactly like that. yeah yeah, that's nice. But I would like it's to... Hard, but, sorry, what? I was just going to say it's hard when you, you know, your hands are full with a guitar, so... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, I wanted to, to I wanted to play, I wanted to, I wanted the, the live guitar playing to be really good. Uh, so I had to sort of be fairly focused on that and also the singing. So I didn't have time to like, you know tweak a filter mm. on the push or whatever uh, right. <laughs> basically i had to had to simplify a lot <laughs> mm. but it was good fun it's really good fun i'd like mm. to do more of that yeah yeah that's cool i like the idea of uh kind of giving yourself those sort of beds to play mm. over yeah exactly that you don't necessarily need to uh worry about like you said being right on time and just that's fun I think that's also, uh, I'm not, I'm not the, I'm not like the world's biggest Wilco fan. I feel like it's starting to sound like that in, 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 in this, on this podcast, (laughs) but they have a, a thing, especially probably on the Yankee Hotel Foxtrot album where they have a lot of really weird sound scapey stuff happening underneath what, what are essentially folk and rock songs. It makes for a, like a really interesting 
mix. And the sounds can be, uh, the songs can be fairly straightforward, but the sounds underneath can be weird as, you know, weird as you like. And the, I, I like that combination. Yeah, they, they do that very well, where yeah. they have a pretty straight ahead song. Yeah. Exactly. But then there's all that fun chaos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. It's something you did really well on the record. What And the thing I always find challenging is balancing acoustic instruments with electronic ones. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes they're just so starkly different. You know, an acoustic guitar is so dynamic and yeah. has so much range and it's not played on a grid. Even if you're playing to a metronome, it has so much fluctuation. I, I always find it very challenging to make that work. And I think you did a really nice job even incorporating like some drum machine elements. It sounds like some drum machines anyway. I think some acoustic drums as well. Yeah, most of it's, um, uh, it's really nice. sample, what's that? The C78 drum machine. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah, old some, school. Some old piece, yeah. Yeah. But I think I think you're right. It's, it's um, probably it's because my guitar playing is sort of sloppy enough that it sort of plays against the sort of stiffer elements of a drum machine. So it sort of, hmm. it sort of, comes alive a little bit uh, just from that. I think I think that might be it. <laughs> if I were a better <laughs> rhythm guitar player, it, it, you know, <laughs> maybe it didn't work, wouldn't work so well. Well, it doesn't sound sloppy, you know. No, I, but I, I guess naturally it's like, a better um, way to say it. Yeah. But yeah, I also, yeah, I I've, been, I've been thinking about it like uh, in, in theory for a while, I've sort of tried to start a few projects where I, uh, where I had would, wanted to do like, okay, it's going to be like acoustic guitar, the Moog Minotaur for bass and uh, some like 808 drum machine or whatever. But I haven't been able to make it work yet, but I have a few of these like, I'm, re I'm interested in finding that mix because I like the idea of, of a, a fairly sort of traditional folk singer artist persona that just found a few new gadgets like, uh, mm -hmm. oh, here's a, you know, string synthesizer. It probably sounds like crap, but, you know, and then they sort of make it work somehow. Uh, right. But, but you're right. It doesn't happen. It takes a little bit of work to get the, the, the machines and the non machines to sort of work together, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's just the quality of the sounds. I don't know how else to mm. put it, but they just, you know, an acoustic guitar exists, it's recorded on a microphone, and then a lot of the other stuff is directly in, or it's not even going into the computer, it's already in the computer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it doesn't have that life outside of the. Yeah, but that, but, that, but that's a good point. I did, uh, I did a lot of stuff where I had like MIDI synths and samples and stuff and then i ran them out of logic uh, out of ableton and then like through some uh like lo-fi making guitar pedal or or the sp404 sampler that has like a great mm. like a vinyl simulator and all and a fairly aggressive compressor and stuff like that to make it sound uh, less clean i guess uh, mm. and that i felt like that worked well with the acoustic instruments it doesn't sound so pristine uh, right you let it get out of there you yeah. let it escape exactly yeah hey i was talking to uh, lyndon williams he makes music as divorce court mm -hmm. and um he loves that sp404 too yeah he's he, as well he yeah. talks about it like that and uh <laughs> it's it sounds like a cool use of it just to bringing some life some there's something about when things travel through a wire and then yeah come exactly back. and and uh, yeah i don't know what that is the the sp404 it really has a sound i i mean i don't use it for any of the like lo-fi hip-hop you know i don't do any of that but it's really nice to hook it up as an 
external effects in, in Ableton and just run stuff through it and use the effects. I li really yeah. like the reverb in there. It's not, uh, it's not very sort of high hi-fi or uh, classy mm. reverb, but it really works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And again, like you just find your way of using stuff yeah. that works for you. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's some good tactics to help things have some more cohesion. Yeah. Just to get them out. Uh, and it's fun. You know, it's sometimes it's very easy to say, well, I've got all the stuff in the computer. I've got a reverb. I've got mm -hmm. a vinyl effect. You know, why not just put the plug in on and not have to get up and move? Yeah. <laughs> I can do yeah, that just sure. by wiggling my fingers in a certain pattern and it happens. But the little bit of effort it takes to plug in something else and just take it out, give it a little adventure. <laughs> yeah, it exactly. In. It comes back weathered and experienced. And yep. Yeah, exactly that. And I guess more I wisdom. Mean, yeah. And I, it's, it's, if nothing else, it sort of slows you down a little bit and that can be good. Hmm. Uh, it takes yeah. you out of right. just adding stuff just because you can, or like your fingers move faster than your, like you, yeah. you do stuff on autopilot, uh, autopilot and yeah, I always add this to this thing. And so why not do it now? And, you know, sort right. of breaks your thought patterns a little bit, I think, which is good. Yeah. And I bet also you're, if you set that up, then you probably have it set up. Mm -hmm. You can leave it set up and then that's a flavor you can add across different songs. Yeah, exactly. If you're looking for some cohesion. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's been a good uh, uh, method for creating that sort of making it sound as a cohesive collection of songs that you sing. There are a few sounds that are maybe not on every song, but like that come and go throughout the album. Uh, mm -hmm. And that can be... Um, yeah, the, the orchestron sample instrument I mentioned, for instance, using that as, as I would probably use like a pad synth uh, and just like running, always running something through, you know, I don't know, my old tape delay guitar pedal or something just, and yeah, it sort of brings the album together, I think. Yeah. I think so. It, it doesn't have to be much. No, exactly. Um, but but just letting your sounds out, resampling them. I've even just I've even put a microphone up to my speakers, yeah, my monitors, you know, and yeah. soloed a sound and just recorded it back in. Yeah, and it's obviously not a very hi-fi approach, but it comes back different. It comes back. You know, like it, <laughs> I said, like an adventure, and I'm starting to think of it that way. Like these little pieces of sound went somewhere; they had a life. Yeah, they came back. They are <laughs> exactly. They're like, you know, full of experience now, and they're yeah. here to add some knowledge or feel to your track. I, I like that idea. I've been meaning to do that thing, putting a mic on the monitor. I'll do, I'll do that next time. It's a good idea. I've one of my favorite experiments I did was with a micro cassette recorder, even mm, just one nice. of those old ones from, you know, nineties, early two thousands, probably with the tiny answering machine yeah, yeah, cassette. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's and good. They sound terrible. I mean, compared to everything we have now, the phone is so clear and clean. Yeah, but yeah. Those tapes, they record the motor sound and everything of the mechanism, but it sounds cool. It, it takes it somewhere else. And if you're, okay with something coming back pretty low-fi and gritty. Yeah, yeah. It's, and even like you can kind of like wiggle it a little and it kind of, <laughs> as oh, you're nice. recording and get some <laughs> get weird phasing and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. And yeah, I'll try that just, for sure. That sounds great. Th I think when you hear your songs, maybe it's only something that happens for you as the creator, but it's like, oh yeah, I remember when I did that sound. I mm -hmm. did this weird thing as opposed to maybe like all the other sounds that you've done in your life where you just dropped them in and, and yeah. sequenced MIDI or something. And they just, they don't stand out from each other. 
that's a good point. Yeah, to, to, to know how you... It could be uh, also like just remembering what mic you used for an acoustic guitar or uh, mm. just like how you made something. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. I'll keep that in mind going forward. That's a good idea. Do you remember how you mic'd up the acoustic guitar? I had, um, on some of the tracks, it was just like an SM57, I think. And mm. on some of them, it was probably the Neumann, what's it? TLM 103, something like that. Right. It's like a, right. Pretty clear, Has it, good for vocal mic. Is that at the same time or? I don't. Or no, I don't. I think I just did either, times. either or. Uh, hmm. I've been thinking the, for the, the next project. To, Amazing. Sorry, <laughs> the trusty old fifty-seven. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Don't need anything else. But for the next project, I think I'm going to invest in a, like some sort of a ribbon mic and see how okay, that works. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm interested yeah, I don't to have a ribbon that. mic myself, but um, I've <laughs> talked to a few people actually that have been really into them. And I actually had a guest on once that makes his own and oh, cool. got me wanting them. I still haven't pulled the trigger. Was, uh, I guess I that's I the thing, like first. when you start recording <laughs> acoustic instruments, your gear sort of curiosities shift a little bit uh, away yeah. from getting a new plugin or getting a new synthesizer or sample pack or whatever you can get like maybe i should just get another mic and that'll transform my whole sound <laughs> mm -hmm. right something to run that mic through <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah oh yeah it never stops does it no it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> Well, I guess that's why you have your policy of getting rid of stuff after a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it probably makes the time a little more special, you know. Um, I've certainly got instruments lying around that I haven't played in a long time that I know mm -hmm. I like, but maybe if I knew the time was coming up soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'd find, find a use for them. Yeah, right. <laughs> I should figure out like some kind of system, like maybe like after a year, if I haven't played it, it's got to go. So it might encourage me to get to it. Yeah. Know? Well, yeah. It's been eight months. I better play that thing. Or it's <laughs> exactly. got to go. Yeah. Master the, <laughs> yeah. But you, I guess you make so many sample packs and stuff. So you could basically, uh, in a way, keep everything. <laughs> Yeah, I've, and I've done that. And a lot of times when I make those packs, I don't feel a need to use the instrument as much anymore. Mm, yeah. Especially if it's something that's kind of clunky to program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or uh, isn't necessarily fun to manipulate while mm. you're playing it. Like a lot of that stuff, it's just like, I'd rather just open it up in the computer. Yeah. And when you sample stuff, does that thing we were talking about. It gives it that journey. Yeah, you know, yeah Especially exactly. if you have a little fun with how you sample it. Yeah. It, it has that life a little bit. But at the same time, I find too many of those sounds together sometimes, then they start to sound the same and they don't sound special from each other anymore. Mm, okay. So. Yeah, I guess. Um, a lot of what I, I've discovered is that just having things that are different from each other makes a big difference so if i'm recording things with say like nice microphones to then record something with like a really cheap mic yeah it, it has its own little spot in the mix and its own life and that's a good trick i think um, i think it's, it's something to some cheap stuff <laughs> i guess it's easy to get into that like if you're recording a lot at home and you're on a budget and stuff maybe you have one nice microphone and then use that for everything. Yeah. Which, I mean, it can absolutely work. It works for a lot of people, but it, it's nice to have these sort of character pieces that, that could be a mic or a dictaphone or, you know, something that doesn't quite yeah. work or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to look at it, character pieces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, 
I'm a big fan of the album. Seriously, um, I've always really enjoyed your work and found it inspiring. And the way you work is really cool. It's focused and it has direction. And that's something I'm always trying to figure out in my work. I talk so much about it on the podcast <laughs> and it's still hard to get down. Yeah, It's hard to find direction when you can go in every possible direction at all times. Yeah, I think I might be uh, weird in a way that I I don't have uh, I sort of I I'm a, I don't have all that many ideas uh, in a way. Uh, mm. I guess I'm just wired for for minimalist minimalism. That sounds like a humble brag. I know. I'm sorry, but I don't mm. have that sort of the curse of <laughs> like too many ideas. I don't have that. Which is uh, yeah. um, uh, a blessing, a I thing. guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I spend a lot of my time like trying to decide what to do next. Yeah. And and yeah. sometimes even just in my like daily life. Mm -hmm. I, I did it yesterday before I went on that beach trip. I kind of stood around and paced. Maybe I should play some music. Maybe, well, it's nice out there. I, mm, I probably yeah. wasted a half hour of my day just <laughs> wandering around <laughs> trying to decide. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that happens to me too. And I have plenty of other issues, but uh, but the one about <laughs> overloading uh, music production with stuff, I don't have. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> well, definitely shows itself in, in the music and makes for some really nice cohesive listens. Um, I mean, you've got a ton of these short commute ambient albums, mm -hmm. which are really fun. They just um, create a space, create a, a world to inhabit for a little while. And um, I think you did a great job transitioning to the album too, where with the singing and the lyrics where sometimes it's easy to get scattered with that stuff but mm -hmm. it still stays really focused and has oh, that's this cool. nice thank you thank you for saying that yeah yeah i really enjoyed it and uh, are you planning on um doing any shows are you looking to play out or is it just uh, i'm know? not sure i i i feel like i should <laughs> and i enjoy <laughs> it when i do it but uh, but it's just takes a lot of headspace. Uh, yeah. Well, it's a lot to, you have to get ready and yeah. rehearse. And but I, I mean, I'm often relearning songs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and all of that stuff. So, yeah, and, and I'll probably do a few gigs, but we're not talking world tours or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Hey, that's cool though. Yeah. You get to do enough where it's fun before it starts becoming a drag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Yeah. So I know it comes out in September. Do you have a date on the release? I don't. If you give me uh, half a minute, I could probably find it in. It's queued up yeah. on Spotify. Oh, okay, nice. Uh, music upcoming. It's Spotify knows. <laughs> uh, exactly, Spotify knows. Okay, uh, so there's another single coming out August 31. 31st mm -hmm. and the album is September 14th. Oh, cool. That's actually quite close. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. It's, it's getting close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. August 31st is the next single. And you said September 14th, four, 14th. Yeah. Nice. That's exciting. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, is there anything uh, we should talk about before we go or what do you think uh i have a i have a an ableton tip or trick oh cool uh that i used for one of the tracks on the album uh you used to be able to do it with tape machines what i had i had like a full mix of a song uh i bounced it and then i What's it called in, in Ableton? When you pitch it down, I pitch it down a full octave and also uh, put it in half tempo. Okay, like uh, warping it? Mm. Yeah, warping. And then I sang 
background vocals on top of that. Uh, and when I pitched it up, everything back up again, I had this Smurf, uh, a, a tiny Smurf choir. Oh. <laughs> You know, I was wondering if you had other people singing on that. No, it's all because it had these like different voices. That's yeah. great. So you stretched it out and slowed it down. Yes. So I uh, pitched it down and slowed it down. Yeah. And exactly. sang over that. Yeah. And then I went and oh, brought cool. it back so that, up again. It sounds like a bunch of right. smurfs. So they're not just pitched, they're also sped up as well. Yeah, exactly. And I, nice. really, I got to re-listen for that. Yeah, it, it, it's it, it's not. Uh, yeah, it'll be in one of the tracks on the album. So, mid mm -hmm. mid September, you you'll get to enjoy it. <laughs> but it was a good. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I didn't re I didn't need to buy like a tape machine to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or or hire anyone or any of that stuff. None of that stuff. Um, it sounded cool. I'm I. I'm not sure which track, but I noticed that there were some voices, some background vocals, some nice harmonies. Yeah. That to me, I thought somebody else was singing, maybe even a female. No, yeah, it's um, all me, but it's uh, like a few different octaves and a bit of sort of Simon and Garfunkel inspired harmonies and that type yeah. of thing. And, 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 That's and so cool. uh, we used a bunch of different mics for the vocals. Uh, so they sound a, okay. bit, a little bit different just from that, but it's, it's just right. still my voice. Yeah, that's smart. Cause sometimes when you're blending your own voice, it's so, it's so close. It's so exact. And yeah, even just exactly. the way you say words is exactly the same way. Yeah. So to change the mic is a smart move just to give it some separation. That was the, one of the benefits of using, uh, a, uh, an engineer for the, for the vocal tracking because he had a bunch of right. nice stuff and he knew how to work, how to use it. So knew what to cool. do, right? <laughs> and you could just stand there and do your thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. Um, let's see. Where do you like to send people to find your stuff? Is it just through? I know we have a band camp. Yeah, um, uh, I think you probably if you just want to see what I'm up to during my week, it's Instagram. Uh, I guess Spotify is a good platform for this album now. Uh, it'll be on Bandcamp eventually, but I'm not I'm not sure when because it's like a this small label who's releasing the the music. So uh, I'm oh, not sure what nice. the plans are. But I can get cool. you all the links. Yeah, yeah, we'll put them in the show notes so mm. people can get right to it. Cool. I love it. Congratulations. It's not easy to finish a project and especially one that's a bit of a departure or, yeah. or maybe a return to some of your older roots. Yeah. Um, so well done. Uh, thank you for doing it because it proves to the rest of us that it's not impossible even when it feels <laughs> like it. <laughs> yeah, well. And it really came out great. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's lovely to hear. And thanks for uh, talking to me again. Yeah, anytime. It's always nice to catch up. Mm -hmm. We'll do it again the next time you come out with something and we'll talk about uh, what brought that on. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be faster next time. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, cool. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone that listened. Um, Go check out Jorgen's work. We'll put all the links in the show notes and have a great day.